नमस्कार अपने सर्व मनापासन स्वागत करतो या व्याख्यान मालेच्या पहिल्या वर्षी प्रसिद्ध विचारवंत आणि समीक्षक श्री सदानंद मेनन यांनी व्हिज्युअलायझिंग आयडेंटिटी द कल्चरल पॉलिटिक्स ऑफ द्रविडियन नॅशनॅलिझम या विषयाचं पहिलं पुष्प गुंफलं होतं दुसऱ्या वर्षी ख्यातनाम चित्रकार आणि वक्ते श्री गुलाम मोहम्मद शेख यांनी स्टोरी ऑफ द टंग अँड द टेक्स्ट द नॅरेटिव्ह ट्रॅडिशन्स ऑफ इंडियन आर्ट या विषयाचं दुसरं पुष्प गुंफलं होतं आज या व्याख्यान मानेतलं तिसरं व्याख्यान इथं होणार आहे आणि हे तिसरं पुष्प गुंफणार आहेत भारतातील एक महत्वाचे सामाजिक शास्त्रज्ञ आणि समाजाभिमुख विचारवंत प्राध्यापक शिव विश्वनाथन आणि त्यांच्या व्याख्यानाचा विषय आहे कामयू कम्स टू इंडिया व्हायलन्स कल्चर अँड स्टोरी टेलिंग हे भाषण इंग्रजीतून असणार आहे आणि आजच्या या व्याख्यानाच्या अध्यक्षस्थानी आहेत सुप्रसिद्ध नाटककार सतीश आळेकर राज फाउंडेशनच्या संचालिका श्रीमती परिमल चौधरी यांना मी विनंती करतो की त्यांनी मान्यवरांचं पुष्पगुच्छ देऊन स्वागत करावं प्राध्यापक प्रोफेसर शिव विश्वनाथ सतीश आळेकर थँक्यू मकरंद साठे यांना मी विनंती करतो की त्यांनी आजचे प्रमुख व्यक्ते वक्ते आणि अध्यक्ष यांचा परिचय करून द्यावा तसंच ही व्याख्यान मला सुरू करण्यामागची भूमिका थोडक्यात मांडावी मकरंद नमस्कार आपल्या सगळ्यांचं परत एकदा मी स्वागत करतो खरं तर आता भूमिका परत मांडण्याची पूर्णाशाने आवश्यकता नाही कारण आपण सगळेजण दोन तीन वर्ष इथे येतात इमेल्समधून आणि वर्तमानपत्रातून आपल्याला माहिती आहे परंतु अनेक तरुण मुलंही मला ऑडियन्समध्ये दिसत आहेत आणि ते अत्यंत महत्वाचं आणि चांगलं लक्षण आहे असं मी मानतो त्यांना कदाचित बापट सर कोण होते कशाकरता ही व्याख्यान मला हे माहिती नसेल म्हणून आधी दोन चार वाक्यामध्येच मी ती ओळख करून देतो मी इंग्रजीमध्ये ओळख करून देतो कारण भाषण पण इंग्रजीत आहे प्रोफेसर राम बापट वॉज अन एक्स्ट्रा ऑर्डिनरी इंटेलेक्च्युअल ॲज वी ऑन नो हु एक्सपायर्ड ऑन जुलै टू थाउजंड अँड ट्वेल्व्ह माय असोसिएशन वॉज विथ हिम फॉर मोर दॅन थर्टी इयर्स अँड आय सपोज मेनी ऑफ दोज मेनी ऑफ अस इन द ऑडियन्स ऑल्सो हॅव दॅट काइंड ऑफ अ लॉंग हॅड दॅट काइंड ऑफ अ लॉंग असोसिएशन विथ हिम writers painters social activists political activists intellectuals obviously in fact he was uh, with people from so many spheres that he was a nodal agency for uh, an intellectual kind of a uh, activity and getting to to together hundreds of me uh, were benefited like uh, because of him uh, he, he, he was not only a par excellence intellectual but we know many intellectuals who are analytically very good but his speciality was that he was also synth- he was excellent at his synthesis making many kind of things come together establishing different uh, contacts uh, between uh, different disciplines etc etc which is very very rare and we have made it a point to invite people to speak who have these specific uh, qualities uh another we talk about divisions in the society that the society is very divided now the divisions are going growing normally we talk about economic divisions about caste divisions gender divisions etc there is another division division which is equally important that is the division between intellectuals and the common man intellectuals and the workers or intellectuals and the artists and it was never so if you study the history of theater history of theater it was never so it is growing so badly and professor bapert city single handedly tried to mend this tried to bridge this gap throughout his life 
So we have also made it a point that we call people who are such a public intellectuals doing the same, trying to do the same thing in their own spheres. Uh, Professor Bapar's three major concerns were politics, society, and art. Art including um, uh, theater, literature, cinema, etc. So we have we give full freedom to the speaker to choose his or her topic. Only thing is that the, the topic will stand on this tripod. As you know, from last two years, this is the tripod on which the topic will uh, revolve. Uh, lastly, but not the least, uh, we needed a lot of funding for the case activity. One phone call and Praj Foundation gave us everything that we needed. We didn't have to ask them, we didn't have to write mails, we didn't have to uh, submit projects, nothing like that. And that is going on now for these two, three years. Uh, also, very unexpectedly, two of Bapar's uh, sisters, Sunita Joshi and Davidya Athole, also on their own came and uh, gave us some financial support. We are extremely uh, grateful to all of them. Now I come to this year's lecture. We are lucky to have an eminent thinker and public intellectual, Professor Shiv Yashwanathan. Don't be afraid, I am not going to give his entire introduction because it runs uh, and very long. I will be as brief as possible. As I mentioned earlier, Professor Shiv Vishwanathan is an eminent public intellectual and a social scientist, best known for his contribution to developing the field of science and technology studies and for the concept of cognitive justice, a term that he coined. He is currently Professor, Vice Dean and Executive Director, Center of Study of Science, Society and the Sustainability at O.P. Jindal Global University in Haryana. He is a social anthropologist with a PhD from Delhi University. She was taught at Delhi School of Economics as a senior fellow at the Center for Study of Developing Societies in Delhi, as also professor at the Dhirubhai Ambani Institute of Information and Communication Technology in the Gandhi Nagar. She has been visiting professor at the University of Maastricht in Holland, distinguished fellow at the University of South Africa, visiting professor at Stanford University, Harry Lewis professor at Smith College, College Massachusetts, visiting professor at Goldsmith College in London, and visiting professor at the Center for Science Policy at Arizona State University, USA. This is not an exhaustive list. I'm just giving some samples. She has authored two books, Organizing for Science, Oxford University Press, and a Carnival for Science, again OUB, and has co-edited the foul play, Chronicles of Corruption. He has served as chairman, Lokayan, 1980-90, editor, IUMDA newsletter, member editorial board, Lokayan Bulletin, member editorial board, alternative, Delhi, Colorado, till 1997, member advisory board, studies in science, technology, and society, SAGE, Member Advisory Board Studies in Humanities and Social Sciences, Indian Institute of Advanced Studies, Shimla. Member of Board of Management for the, of the Center for Environmental Planning and Technology, Ahmedabad. His interests center on cultures of knowledge, popular culture, urban studies, the sociology of corruption, sociology and philosophy of science, history of technology, social movements, globalization, culture, and the politics of environmentalism, disaster management, and future. He, futures, he also writes on walking and, and, and violence. So, I mean, that's a spread. As a public intellectual, he is a regular columnist in, columnist in uh, newspapers like The Hindu, The New Indian Express, The Indian Express, The Deccan Chronicle, and The Asian Age. We also are used to seeing him on TV and all the channels. He also contributes to popular magazines like Outlook, India Today, Governance Today, and Telka. I can go on, but I will stop. I have had the pleasure of being on the same platform in two conferences with him. On two occasions, I had the best key to listen to him. And also getting an article that I had written from him for a book which I edited. What I experienced then makes me so eager to listen to him again that I cannot go on anymore. Many of you might have got an email saying that uh, Pushpa Bhave is going to be chairperson. Uh, I have to say that unfortunately she couldn't come, she is not keeping well. Uh, in such, such a case, we needed somebody who has the stature to be here without doubt. 
and we naturally turned <laughs> to Satish Arekar, who, who, who is our very senior friend and uh, will be acceptable to everybody without any doubt. Actually, for Pune audiences, I don't need to uh, talk anything about him. His plays like Manirwan, Begumbar, Vemapur are internationally acclaimed. He also ran what is equally important, Lalit Kala Kendra in Pune University for so many years. And now we know how many students are active from that Kendra. And uh, all of I mean, I can again go on and on because he is one of my most uh, favorite uh, writers. But I will uh, stop here. I welcome them both. I welcome all of you. And we'll, in a couple of minutes, start the lecture, sir. Gajana. आभारमान नेसर्टी वक्त हो गया है या व्याख्यान मालेची कल्पना सुसले पसुन ती संपूर्ण पने कार्यान्वित करने सर्टी चा आयोजन नियोजन प्रक्रिया में दे विशेषत्वान जानी मदद के लिए आशा प्राच फाउंडेशन अनि तेजा संचालिका श्रीमती परिमल सौधरी साधना साप्ताहिक पाक्षिक परिवर्तन सवाट सरु सर्व मराठी अनि इंग्रजी व वृत्त चित्र संपादक वार्ता प्रतिनिधि ऑल इंडिया रेडियो पुणे स्टेशन एस एम जोशी सभागृहा व्यवस्थापक कर्मचारी बार सेंटोन्स प्रदीप मड़ी आ अर्थात अपन सर्व उपस्थित बापट सर प्रेमी जन हो जी प्रत्यक्ष कि अप्रत्यक्षरित मदद के लिए सर्वान से मी मनापास आभार मानतो धन्यवाद देते आता प्राध्यापक शिव विश्वनाथन भाषण होल भाषणान श्री सतीश आड़ेकर अध्यक्षीय भाषण होल अनेत्यान अंतर आज से कार्यक्रम संपेल। अतः अपन अपने मोबाइल कृपया बंद करूँ ठेव आगे ही नंबर 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 विनंती। Now I request Professor Shiv Vishwanath to kindly deliver his lecture. I guess I'm a bit nervous because I think Makaran makes me sound like some old syllabus. <laughs> and also I'm a historian of science, happier looking at a crystal than at a poem. Yet, I must thank Makaran for forcing me to read Camus. In fact, he hauled me to a seminar in Paris where apart from reading the casual Camus, I bought myself a stack of book on Kabu and started reading, discovering the multifarious aspects of the man. And I think it's appropriate that one lectures on Kabu when talking about Ram Bapat. I only met the man once. I think it was significant. He had come to the center for study of developing societies, gave a speech, which was strange because it looked as if the man was, you, the way he looked at the problem, you didn't know whether he was wrestling with it or making love to it. There was a sense of confusion, but there was also a sense of celebration. And after the talk, I was sitting with uh, two of my distinguished colleagues, Giri Deshinkar and Rajni Kothari. And in those days, I was a bit smart, and I said, what did he say? And Giri Deshinkar turned out and said, that's the trouble with you smart guys. He can struggle with confusion. So every time you meet him, he's closer to an approximation of truth than you'll ever be. In fact, Bapat uses confusion as a tactic to wrestle with truth. And the other thing is, just as I was accepting this lecture, I got an uh, invitation from the Institute of Advanced Study at Simla. But they said, can you come for the seminar on the imagination of the city? And I sent my regrets. And the professor then responded beautifully. He said, let me introduce myself. My name is Kushal Deb. I was also a student of Ram Bapat. And he wrote me a beautiful letter. But he first said, you have to understand the man. Kushal Deb, in fact, described him as a commons which everyone could access, everyone could talk to, because he could listen in a way no one else did. And then he said, 
Ram Bapa didn't finish a PhD, but he sired 50 PhDs. That's the generosity of the man. And then he said, I have to say something more personal. He said, in those days, state universities were treated with contempt. From what I gather, they still are. But it's more now a case of benign neglect. And at that time, Kushal Dev decided to respond to an arrogant statement made by Veena Das that PhD programs should not be allowed in regional universities. He wanted to, in fact, reform the syllabus. But in his aggressive tactic of reforming the syllabus, along with his friend Sharmila Lagay, he was subject to disciplinary proceedings. Kushal, by that time, had joined IIT Bombay, but he couldn't get tenure because this disciplinary committee was hanging on him. And he said, that's when I realized the decency and generosity of Ram Bapert. He made that committee into an aesthetic act. He made me feel good. And he cleared me in a way no one else could have done. And he said, I'm glad you're not coming to Simla because you and I both owe it to Ram Bapert. I must admit my illiteracy on Camus. But I take a certain comfort in illiteracy after my late friend and mentor, you are Anand Muti, once said, India needs to be illiterate. Illiterates in India speak four to five languages, while a convent school girl speaks only one, English. And I want to leverage my illiteracy on Camus. In fact, I've remembered my old friend Samik Bandupatya telling me a story. Tamikna loves books, hunts for books like other people hunt for other things. And he suddenly heard that D.P. Mukherjee's collection of books that somehow moved from Lucknow to Calcutta. And he managed to buy a full set of D.P.'s books. Among them was a full collection of Camus, in which there was an inscribed copy of D.P. on The Stranger. In the front of the car, D.P. had written, brilliant and profound. And a few years later, he had written in the back, brilliant but not profound. And in a way, that comment fascinated me. Because the brilliant Camus is well known. But the less brilliant Camus, I think today might be more profound. And for this insight, you'll have to blame Makarand. And what I want to do today is to leverage what I call the lesser Camus, because it's less political, less subject to criticism, and yet has possibilities of a tremendous order. So let me explain the structure of my lecture, if I can give it that pompous introduction. My lecture has three parts. First is about the politics of memory. Second is about the politics of history. And third is about the politics of decency. A bit disappointing in the age of heroism and ideology, but I think decency is very important. And in a way, Camus was a great writer on decency, but Bapat zipped that act. And in doing so, I want to do something, and this is the experimental part of the exercise. I want to imagine Camus in India. So what I'm going to do, with the politics of memory, I'm going to look at the politics of citizenship. With the politics of history, I'm going to look at the whole question of the partition. And with the politics of decency, I'm going to look at the emergency and the Gujarat riots. How would Camus look at these things? What makes him vital? Because for me, his writing on Algiers, his trauma, his contradictions, his confusions, to use a bapat like word, made him much more significant today. I'm not interested in the dominant Camus, the Cold War intellectual, the editor of combat, the man who to a certain extent was condemned by later colonial intellectuals as irrelevant, a man spoofed by Edward Said and Connor Cruz of Brain. Yet when I read Camus, what I call the defeated Camus, the lesser Camus, I find him deeply poignant. And this is really what I want to talk about. Let me begin also by emphasizing that 
Kamu was a great storyteller who thought about the act of storytelling. And in thinking about storytelling, he becomes a great social scientist. Because he could bring to social science things social scientists never talked about. There's a pomposity to social science, I have to confess it. A pomposity that derives from policy, but also because social scientists make the worst storytellers. And yet, something more. What Camus showed is that social science is full of silences that we need to understand. And the first thing he points out is what he calls the absence of the body in social science. He says Christianity and social science have something in common. They play, play down the body. The strange thing is, how can you have a theory of the body politic which ignores the centrality of the body? And in this context, he first of all begins by developing with something which I think is absolutely fascinating. A theory of sensuality. He says, between nature and history stand the body and the senses. Democracy to him was really literally coming to the senses. Sight, sound, touch, smell, played out in terms of the cartography of the skin, actually creates a different kind of consciousness. You don't begin with ideology. You don't begin with history. You begin with the skin. Because the skin is your first society. The skin is memory. The skin can en engraved on the skin is the politics of time. Kamu gives a brilliant example. He says, when you go swimming, over the day you see the skin change color. And in the very change in the colors of the palette of the skin, time evolves in a different way. And he says the same thing with old age. Old age is the smell, a cartography, a texture that you have to capture because it's out of this sense of sensuality, sense of smell. We said old age smells. But after that smell comes your sense of memory, touch, taste. That is to a certain extent the very idea of sensuality changes your notion of time. In fact, I remember once asking my students, describe your grandmother's face. They said, ridiculous. I said, no. Have you ever touched her face? And then one of them said, my grandmother smelled of pickle. But yes, it was a memory. And it's this that I think Kamu brings out. That the, without the politics of the senses, without the sense of taste and smell, memory is impossible. And the politics of the skin becomes important in that context because it articulates the geography of suffering, the geography of time. Skin has a politics, but a politics that goes beyond race because it captures the politics of the ordinariness of time, the poetics of suffering. Skin, in fact, there should be a history of skin because to a certain extent, it captures in a literary way what a man undergoes. But Camus puts it brilliantly. He said skin is symbolism because skin gives you the hieroglyphs through which the body suffers through time. So reading the skin is like reading the archaeology of a or the autobiography of a person. I was fascinated. Because for someone like a sociologist, you begin with the monuments, Marx, Weber, Durkheim. And this man says, skin is sociology. The senses are sociology. And he goes even further and says, you can't have a society which is dominated by one sense. Because when you do that, you begin the process of abstraction. I, mean, I was just reading Robert Romanishan recently. But he says, the trouble with Western society is it's too dominated by sight. The history of the linear perspective leads to the history of science and the nation state. When you adopt the linear perspective, you disembody. Because the linear perspective is based on distance. Once you put a window between man and object, you objectify him. You distance him. 
In fact, as Hannah Arendt said, you create an astronomical self where you think you can't understand a person till you're miles away from him. You create an astronomical self. But Camus says, an astronomical self is not tactile. It can't smell. It can't touch. And I think this is the beauty of Camus. He builds his critique of the nation state. He builds his critique on scientism, on the history of smell and taste. You can't understand skin. You can't understand society. If you can't understand the senses, then you'll never understand the nation state and the illiteracy of the nation as an idea. Let me push it further. Come on, shows that memory has to have this sense of embodiment. And he takes an example, which I think Makarnand has mentioned many times, about trying to remember his father in a fiction. And he says, in the first man, the soldier, who I think in a way is Camus himself, goes down to the cemetery, tries to remember his father. And he finds his mother had never told him anything about it, except that he died. In fact, his mother had kind of impoverished memory, which didn't even know what an island was. All she says was, he was there. And he tells, she tells Camus, he looked like you. And suddenly, Camus realizes, he has no embodied picture of his father. He realizes his father is an abstraction. And at that moment, he looks at the dates in the cemetery. The dates where his father was born, and the date where his father died. And suddenly it hits him that stand, you're standing before a grave of a man who was younger than him. The son is older than the father. And at that moment, the poignancy of it hits him because in a way, for the first time, he creates a living relationship with the father. Time, memory, body, embodiment create a world which abstractions can't understand. Or what Camus calls before my father was information without meaning. And now he's the story. The politics of storytelling is crucial to Camus. And in fact, to understand storytelling and to understand society, you have to understand silence. Camus, like Virginia Woolf, was a master of silences. Silence speaks a language, silence is its own continent. Silence has dialects and diversity which one must understand. And without the politics of silence, you cannot understand the politics of democracy. In fact, he talks about different kinds of silences. And it's in this context that Kambu looks at the problem of exile and citizenship. Most people tend to think of exile in terms of displacement of space. Camus talks of exile in terms of displacements of time. He says every man is in exile when he can't reconstruct his childhood. When you try to reconstruct your childhood, you discover you cannot recover it. The very moment of homecoming is the period of time of exile. So in a way, Every act of biography, every act of citizenship is a moment of homecoming, which is also a moment of exile. This is a different notion of exile. This is not the 19th century exile of Bakunin. This is not the exile and displacement of the refugee. This is an exile of ordinariness, which every man confronts in the moment of aging. Time exiles you from yourself, because yourself is only a collection of approximations. No biography, no autobiography can be scientific because every storytelling is only an act of approximation of a truth that you barely remember. It's moving. Then he goes a bit further. And he says, once you understand the body, once you understand the senses, you realize that the real myth of Sisyphus today in a world of history is it is citizenship and the making of citizenship, which is a Sisyphean act. We with our passports and our Aadhaar cards take citizenship for granted. But we are the minority. 
Because the exile, the stranger, the outsider, the marginal, the nomad, have no availability of citizenship. They dominate the discourse today. Citizenship is a kind of permanence which resists the temporiness of residentship, the temporiness of identity, which all of us face. I think we're looking at exile in a different way because exile becomes central to citizenship. Because in a way it questions the very language, I am Indian. In fact, I remember the first time I told my father I am Indian. He said, actually you are half Pakistani. I was born in Lahore. Now for a Tamil Brahmin who believes Chennai is the center of the world, that can be quite traumatic. But at that moment one realized something. We are talking about membership of a different kind. So I think every here person here is both exile and citizen, both homeless and very much at home. And it's that definition of citizenship which alters the way you look at the other. Because every man is the other confronting himself. This changes the whole way we look at Camus. Because the question he then asks is very different. It's not a question of master and slave, colonizer and colonized. What happened to all the intermediate groups? Is the French, Algerian and Algerian French belong to France or to Algeria? Or is he caught in the liminality of the Pied Noir, the dirty feet? So they have no claim to history, no claim to nationhood. In fact, I was thinking about Camus and time. And recently my partner who worked with Chandrika, with Ashish Nandi, did a fantastic essay on time and the partition. And then one realized that history is unfair. Because the history of partition is sheer narrow provincial illiteracy. What partition really misses is the art of storytelling which begins with memory, which begins with the senses, which begins with the body. And she gives a series of examples which I found stunning. Some of them I worked with her, but it's basically her work. And the first story she gives me is the as if nature of the partition. He said when you write history of the partition, you write about the transfer of power, masculine, pompous, historical, monumental. And then you look at the partition stories, you get a different idea. What if the partition was different? What if the partition didn't happen? What if the partition makes no sense? Recently, I saw an interview between Kapil Dev and Imran Khan, where they were dreaming of the possibilities of a joint Indo-Pakistan cricket team. My great dream as a child. Should we have six Pakistanis and five Indians or vice versa? But in that moment, you're trying to bring together what the nation has kept apart. And let me just give you a few stories to make sure how relevant Camus is today. One of the stories in Chandrika Pama's work is about a group of, it takes place in a village where a Sikh community suddenly discovers it's surrounded by Muslims. The patriarch suddenly realizes that he is responsible and he knows if they go out, the woman would be raped and the men would be killed. So he summons all of them, 60 of them. And he says, I'm going to behead each one of you. But this is the true story, by the way. And just before he's about to do that act, his sister gives him his ritual glass of milk. And then each one of them steps in front of him and he takes his sword and beheads them. Because he didn't want the men to be insulted or the woman to suffer rape. The last one is the grandchild who suddenly says, that I'll fight with you. I don't want to die. And he lets the kid live. And they step out. The crowd is about to lynch them when an old villager says, this Sadar helped us in the time of distress. And the villagers do something very strange. They bow to him and let the two of them go. 
But suddenly the man realizes, what have I done? I've killed 50 of my own people. And the grandchild who relates the story, that's the poignancy of it, commits suicide. The question is raised is not the official history. It's the way one has to live with the possibility of violence. What if the grandfather had decided? Partition is full of these what if stories. What if it had worked in a different way? History confronts the alternative imaginations of the storyteller. And it's stunning. Let me push it further. In one of the other interviews, we were working with a man who ran an affluent treatment plant. Interesting guy. After a while, he discovered we're going to study the partition. He said, I was there. And he gave this full story about the train to Pakistan, how he hid in the bathroom as a child, how he goes to Derya Ganj and discovers dead bodies and eventually discovers a house in Karol Bagh. We interviewed him seven times. But there's something very peculiar about the interview. Till we discovered he wasn't telling his story. He had internalized his grandfather's story. He was three at the time of partition. He not only appropriated a story at appropriated time. And you see that very much among the BJP people. They appropriate the time of the grandfathers to actually talk about the politics of communalism. And that's history, working out an artificial kind of politics. And Camus becomes brilliant at this moment. And I remember a debate in Delhi IIT just after the Gujarat riots where suddenly a woman got up and said, at last 500 years of Mughal rule had been defeated. It's not comic. But somehow suddenly different kinds of time, different notions of the body makes you wonder what the partition was about. Was it one moment in history? It wasn't. Partition took place between 47 and 55. And many people couldn't decide which side to join, so they kept going back and forth. Partition was not a transition. It was a pendulum swing because you couldn't decide whether you're Indian or Muslim. Something captured beautifully by Manto. And this is the problem. In fact, sometimes when the logic of the nation state eventually enters the partition, it becomes even more criminal. Remember with the Punjabis, the men who raped the woman married them. In 55, the nation state separates these lovers. What is the logic of nation state? Is it the logic of separation? And this is what Kamu asks. What is this nation state we talk about? I know I'm being unpatriotic, but let me push it further. He said, nation states begin in the movement of decadence. They offer a geometry when it's all confusion, because no nation state is a country. A nation state is an abstraction. And the 20th century is full of abstractions, because you're sentenced to death for abstractions. A country has memory. A region has claims to a body, to nature, to time, to connectivity. A nation is one of the most impoverished entities we can think of. And yet it's the alphabet of modern India and the modern international system. Because the nation suppresses alternative histories. This is Camus. Because to me, it's not the communist Camus or the combat Camus that makes sense. The poignancy of loss, which captures the poignancy of such cold scientific concept like the nation state. You have to understand. Let me push it further. Centrality of the body is stunning. Because I said, imagine. Let me play Camus for a minute. Apologies to Makaran. Where does the body become central? If the body were the source of Indian history, 
then the history of the Indian nation state begins with two genocides. The Bengal famine, where the British eliminated three million people. There's never been a Nuremberg for the British. And the partition. So the history of the Indian state is a history of two genocides. Two crimes against the body which create the body politic called the nation state. And then start. Every major crisis, every act of violence is a violation of the body. Lakshabari, emergency, Bhopal, feticide. Each one of them is a violation of the body. As a violation of the body politic. In fact, you look at all the violences. There's a destruction of the body and an erasure of memory. You come to abstractions. As in this context, I'm going to think of Camus' work on poverty. Imagine Camus sitting in the planning commission. Not far-fetched. Could have happened at a certain time. And then he says, poverty is not destitution. The smell of poverty near the sea gives me a different kind of freedom. I'm not sure the members of the planning commission crunching numbers would understand. They would say 32 rupees a day or 50 rupees a day is poverty. And Kamu would say, poverty is memory. Poverty is freedom. Poverty is asceticism. How do we grasp the two? Poverty is an aesthetic. What happens then? When the history of the body, the history of the senses, the history of time, the history of citizenship completely alters the fundamentals of democracy. The silence of concepts here destroys what Camus says makes the tacit constitution of democracy. Around our constitution is a whole set of assumptions about body time, seasonal time, nature which has to be brought in. And that's why social contracts don't make sense. A community is a commons. It operates on the taken for granted. But the history of the obvious is never obvious. That's Camus for me. I wish we have a Camus like figure the next time we write the directive principles of state policy. Let me push it even further. Today we take the nation state like a kind of godhead. In fact, I remember you are Anand Murthy saying, I don't want to stay in a nation headed by Narendra Modi. And immediately, many of the people in the RS said, he should be put on the train to Pakistan. The train to Pakistan is one of the deadliest metaphors. The train to Pakistan consists of all the alternative imaginations partition suppressed. That other day I was thinking, which of my intellectuals would have put on the train to Pakistan? A statement of possibility, a statement of storytelling. Kamu lives not in the debates on totalitarianism and Marxism, but in the debates about the alternative history of possibilities. How much time do I have? Okay. Kamu is critical of the West. I always see him as Western. He wasn't. Because he talked of West, the West never talks about. And in fact, he begins by saying, you know, it's always seen as an opposition between Athens and Jer Jerusalem. The West is not that. He said the West is deteriorated. He said the, the trouble is we have forgotten Greece. Greece was about the aesthetics of limits. Where even justice was modest, quote unquote. And he says the trouble with the West is Protestantism ruined it. He said, look at the Mediterranean. He said the beauty of the Mediterranean climate, the mentality is it in a way humanized the West. Christianity couldn't be Christianity in its cold Judaism. 
Christianity had to become Mediterranean for Francis Assisi to enter warmth into Christianity. But the core logic of Judaism never had the warmth of an Assisi. In fact, he gives the more fascinating examples. He says this is true even of dictatorships. But let me finish. In fact, he then says the trouble with Luther was he was the Protestantism was Catholicism without the Mediterranean. Brilliant. And then he says, you look at even fascism. He says, look at German fascism. Tight lipped, tight collared, formal, abstract, geometric. And then you see the Italian fascist. I mean, there's a kind of languor about him that almost redeems totalitarianism for a moment. Not that you can't criticize Mussolini, but a Mussolini for all his evil is not yet a Hitler, except in the moment of Ethiopia. The moon's clear. And I think this is really what is fascinating. And then he extends this. He says the trouble with the West was we emptied the body out of Christianity. We substituted for it the secular idea of reason. And there's nothing as excessive as reason. Because abstract reason is the beginning of totalitarianism. Abstract reason, because of its scientism, in a way becomes the driving force of history. And the minute you move to an abstract kind of reason, you place values at the end of history, not at the beginning. And when you do that, you remove value from history. The only value of history is the end of history and all the fetishism it brings about. And I think to a certain extent, this becomes powerful. In fact, Camus has a tacit comparison between the novel and the nation state. If you read a lot of his essays together, he said a nation state moves to a kind of scientism. It's a bit like the realist novels which want to be scientific, but scientific novels never produce great creativity. You need the tentative, you need the experimental, you need the uncertain, because without uncertainty and tentativeness, there's no liberty, there's only certainty. A nation state offers you certainty, a novel offers you possibility, and in possibility like the sources of And the second thing he says is, a nation state can be positivist, nation state can be scientific, but a novel is an act of craftsmanship. In fact, he makes a beautiful point. He said, you first be Dostoevsky's to be Tolstoy. Imagine writing the history of the nation state twice, once in terms of the possessed, once in terms of war and peace. The man's imagination is stunning and moving. And you wonder where this lesser Camus disappeared. Till you, I read a statement by Simone Bouvier. My French pronunciation is horrible, so forgive me. And she says, the trouble with Camus is not political, it's ethical. And I guess ethics is a modest enterprise, especially in an age where isms and ideologies dominate history. The modesty of Camus is in his very theory of limits. Because while a revolution can be totalitarianism, a rebellion has limits. A revolution is political to its core. A rebellion is ethical. Revolutions can be collective, but rebellions have to link the social and the individual. In this context, Camus' theory of rebellion gives you a different notion of the limits of dissent. And at the limits of power, you can't kill. Nothing violates a civilization as much as death penalty. Nothing violates a civilization as much as genocide. The limits of justice make sure the other still remains human. And Camus is stunning in this way. Let me push it further. 
Camus was actually one of the greatest sociologists of the city. And he did the sociology of the city out of the sociology of the novel. Let me just take a series of quotes which I found fascinating. He begins by saying, if you look at the history of novel after Dostoevsky, the landscape disappears, nature disappears, the city is arid history. And then he quotes Hegel by saying, history can only exist in the cities because history is the politics of street fights. The city grows as an imagination. And it's in this context that I want to look at the plague. In fact, I read something simultaneously. I read the play and the Sham Commission report simultaneously. It's fascinating. I think the Shah Commission is the great Indian novel. With only a bureaucratic committee report could be the discourse of the nation state. And the Shah Commission is brilliantly and novelistic. In fact, it reminds you a bit of Julio Cortazar's work, where you can read the chapters in any sequence. Dhrenra Brahmachari levitating, B.R. Tamta being as bureaucratic as anyone else. Devilal spending the entire emergency trying to get an alcohol license for his milkman. Karan Singh, while being a civilized philosopher, actually plays Minister of Health in that period. Where does the absurd really end? And it's this that makes it powerful. Because Kamu in another story says something which I want to read. Just, and he says, the end of plague or the end of any dictatorship doesn't bring about redemption and reform. He says, it only brings back the old gang. Here's a quote. He said, here they are, the old gang. They're all coming back. The men of the fast, the fossils, the dead enders, the triflers, smooth tongue, comfortable, the army of tradition, robust and flourishing, spick and span as ever. Anyone who's watched the aftermath of the emergency knows the bureaucrats returned. The trains ran on time again. And then it says, instead of shutting the mouths of who, those who air their grievance, they shut their own ears. We are dumb. We are going to be deaf. The emergency never redeemed us. And if you look at Camus' plague, he offers an anti-heroic view of the emergency. <coughs> of the plague. Camus' hero is no hero. He's an ordinary professional doing an ordinary job, but his ordinariness is amoeboid enough to be heroic. He begins as a doctor, he ends as a doctor. And yet he is a great storyteller. What Camus advocates is not heroism, sacrifice. He says sometimes the best form of resistance is ordinary decency. How much of ordinary decency did we have in the emergency? I remember reading the records of the uh, family planning and there's a poignant moment where vasectomy is taking place in this Mayo village and this old man comes running to the, the bureaucrat and says, I'm over 70, I'm incapable. The bureaucrat says, no. The quotas have to be met. Number, quota. To a certain extent, it is moments of emergencies which show us the absence of heroism in our society. Camus has to be supplemented by Zygmunt Bauman. Bauman on his modernity in Holocaust was a fascinating section about a hijacked plane which showed you, you were never sure who are going to be the heroes in this crowd. And in fact, he says one of the most devastating things about, if you look at the aftermath of hijack, is the number of divorces between husband and wife. Because for the first time, they saw each other in a different way. New possibilities. 
emerging from new emergencies, where the politics of ordinariness has to be worked out in a different way. It's not the banality of evil that worries Camus. It's the ordinariness of goodness. Even Bollywood doesn't understand it. Anyone who has seen an Amitabh Bachchan movie would see the good cop, the good father, the good teacher all disappear before the interval. Because only then is violence possible. What Camus wants is a limit to violence. You need a new kind of myth about what ordinary decency can do in the society. But democracy is about decency. Democracy is about storytelling. It can't be about history and ideology. And there's new Camus. Not of the resistance, not of Marxism, not of the great European debates with Sartre and Maluponte. The Algerian Camus, repressed, dismissed, becomes the futurist theorist of democracy. I salute him. Thank you. In fact, there's a brilliant piece where Camus says about an officer who says, my wife died today, but luckily I have a few forms to fill. That bleakness is there. The aspirational society, the consumption society is the official society. The question then is, can decency rise to a different level? It did during the national movement. It did during the emergency. It did during Bhopal. But in each of these cases, decency was temporary. And the citizens of the official takes over. The question one has to ask all of ourselves is, can decency be innovative? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Social origins of democracy and dictatorship. I mean, where do we, what is the human predicament that you see here, which can take us beyond, beyond any ism, whether capitalism, socialism, state and market, growth and globalization? I think the tremendous possibilities in India uh, let me put it this way. There are two Indias. The India of Narendra Modi, who thinks nuclear energy is the new sacrament. And let me give it to you in terms of a story. I was once at a Texas organic conference where, like every Indian, I said, America is a great information society. Sitting next to me was one of the most pugnacious botanists I know, Wes Jackson. Rudely American. He said, idiot. What's up, Wes? Do you know what I said? What you said just one minute before? He said, India has 50,000, 100,000 varieties of rice, has 100,000 varieties of dreaming. America reduced its 166 appetites to six varieties. Which is the high information society? The question here is, we have a diversity of a different kind. And if you around diversity, build the logic of a different kind of language, a different kind of translation. But all Barrington Murray works in the center periphery model. My friend, you are Anthmuthi, said, let's be a bit more amiable. Let's think of front yard and backyard. Let's think of translation and conversation. Can we change the direction of India? Less successful on GNP. No seat in the Security Council, thank God. Can we create a new imagination for democracy? That's where the writer and the storyteller come today. You know, our human rights is arid. But storytelling, I think it's the new possibility for democracy. And that's my faith. A trifle romantic, but you know, I spent last 10 years studying Narendra Modi. What Modi destroyed in Gujarat was the storyteller. What you eventually produced with the official SIT report, which sanitized him. The stories disappeared. And gossip, rumor, and storytelling come back. Democracy is quite successful. In fact, we notice today what is missing in Delhi is gossip. 
what is even more drastically absent is storytelling. And for me, I think some of you, the storyteller has to come back. Because then you can think of possibilities of a different kind. I see the poignancy of your question, but it can't be solved historically. That is where Barrington Moore loses out. It has to come through these tacit stories, which give you the possibility of a different dream. I mean, I remember once in a women's conference, this tribal woman suddenly realized that the other woman had starvation for 300 days a year. While everyone, like economists were talking about usual thing, he said, you know, it's a pity I only starve 60 days a year. But in support, I will starve 100 days a year. This notion of generosity, reciprocity, might be more important than the current theories of citizenship. Or the current ideas of the nation state. Have any question? I'm relieved. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, whatever you said. Yes, words. Flow of words which have no meaning. Which have no meaning, which have no effect at all. You said violence. You said body. You said human nature. Can Words change the human nature? No. If I call myself Amar, if I call myself Amar, I can't accept death. Words are only words. And this is only the flow of words. Words. Billions of times the words are even used. Billions of mouths have given the words. They are words. Nothing can change. Nothing can change. Nothing can change. Thank you. Modi changed me. <laughs> and I mean it seriously. Words are lived entities for me. Words are embodied worlds. Oh, I love words. Words are what make us human. I don't know any other kind of humanity except the humanity of body and language. If that is the limit, I accept it. But for me, it's a celebration. For you, it's a limit. Let's live our words. No, I think it's important. Because yours is one play of words. Mine is the other. Let the better wager win. I can't offer you more than that. I can't offer you guarantees. But I've, over the last 20 years, I've worked in disaster areas. Orissa Cyclone, Bhopal. You know, Rajni Kothari dumped me and said, he once came up to me and said sardonically, oh, you're the only social scientist who has worked on science. Pack your bags. You're leading the first team to Bhopal. It was traumatic. But some way I realized the notion of the word is bond. Somewhere I realized that words can surprise you. The very polysemy of the word doesn't allow the limiting statement you made. I celebrate the word. Actually, what you might be complaining about is my wordiness. I confess to that. Uh, sir, uh, you have been a political observer for years, for like decades in Delhi. Guilty. And <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, well, uh, as as artist, I'm I'm kind kind of uh, nowadays very much worried as to because we are right now going through this whole national right wing sort of you know feel and there is this kind of a national amnesia that we want to live in that we don't want to talk about past and we want to sort of you know look to the bright future what do you think do you think this kind of a right wing sort of you know wave is going to last for a for, for this 5 years or it's going to be there for next 10 years so that accordingly we can plan our political films you know <laughs> Like, 
for someone who can't stand Modi, I must confess, it is Modi's complaint that made Anil Ambani throw me out of the Dhirubhai Ambani Institute. But I'm grateful to him. Has it showed you what are the possibilities of resistance? Art is resistance to me. And in a way, let me first say it's gloomy. You're right. The way Delhi has caved in, Lutyen's Delhi, in quotes, has caved into Modi is remarkable. But then where are the sources of resistance? Well, like Ram Bapad. And the example he set, nothing heroic, yet so poetic. I begin with that. Resist Modi in small ways. And it'll work. It's not just a question. If you're in the university, fight the syllabus as if it's a constitution. You have to. I think the biggest threat to democracy is majoritarianism and the right wing push. We have to fight it. But we're desperately a minority. You know, Fun Fact gives you very comic situations. My VC who loves power came to me and said, slight problem. I said, what? I have to invite Narendra Modi next semester. I said, brilliant, give me a semester off. He said, you won't behave. I said, no. We need a misbehavioral science of democracy. And I mean it. And the very fact, I think the artist can resist. Have you read Modi's book on climate change and the poems in it? It's worth it. Thank you. I won't forget that I'm a substitute chairperson. I don't want, want to spoil the impact of the such a fine oratory or the words which he <coughs> pronounce for last one, one hour or so. Thank you Vishwanathan for brilliant deliberation on the subject. I'm not that familiar with the subject because I come from the field of performance. Only the storytelling aspect interests me more. But his deliberation gave us a world view in the fragmented atmosphere in which we exist and how our existence is going to become, how to find the meaning of our existence in such a fragmented times. Thank you. I won't go beyond that because the subject is beyond me. But I agreed to become a substitute chairperson because of Ram Babat. I used to know him since our college days. When we were a student on the campus of Pune University, he was there in the political science department. He was right there in the audience when I first read out my first play, Miki and Mem Sahib, at the Film and Television Institute, where Satyadeh Dube was conducting a playwright workshop as a part of his Homi Baba Fellowship program. And Ram Bapat was there to analyze my play and to interpret my own sensibilities to me. And he was doing that kind of a job for years together, for generation after generation. His profound knowledge, wisdom, putting the things in the right perspective is tremendous. And one more important reason I am here, because we both belong to Shanwar Pet. I used to live in Rajakarwada and he used to occupy Agashe Wada. And I thought, I don't think I'm going to say that Agashe Wada is a very good thing. 
त्या वखारीत त्यांच्याकडे गेलं की पाटी दिसायची बाळंतिणींसाठी खास बदामी कोळसे आले आहेत दॅट वॉज आवर कनेक्शन अँड एज फार एज कॅमू इज कन्सर्न आय मस्ट से समथिंग अबाउट कॅमू आय एम नॉट ग्रेट रिडर बिकॉज द लिटरेचर इज नॉट माय कप ऑफ टी परफॉर्मन्स इज द मोस्ट आय चेरिश बट आय रिमेंबर अ फिल्म बेस्ड ऑन कामूज नॉवेल स्ट्रेंजर अँड इट वॉज द डे आफ्टर वेन इरावती कर्वे डाईड अँड द फिल्म वॉज आय थिंक इट वॉज इन सेवंटी अँड द फिल्म मेड ऑन द नॉवेल स्ट्रेंजर वॉज डिरेक्टेड बाय लुशिनो विस्कॉन्ती and the film was running at empire theater in cantonment and i went i think summer nakhati was with me so we went on our bicycles to see the film and as the film was about to begin i saw our lecturer sitting on the back side and she was iravati karve's daughter gauri deshpande and i was such a shock because i still remember the reading first paragraph of the novel stranger it begins with my mother died yesterday maybe today i don't remember and i wish that i must see gauri madam's face but i could not see that because the whole theater went into a dark that was my little connection with Camu thank you Vishwanathan wonderful thank you